What is going on guys? Welcome to a Madden update video in our Big 12 Team Builder Dynasty. It's been a long time. It's been about three months. Last one we gave you guys was in July. Can you believe that? July. But we're in week 16 with the Miami Dolphins and Jeff Henderson, the former Ardmore head coach, is taking on the task of turning around the Miami Dolphins. I will let you guys know here, big players to renegotiate. We are letting these players go. I'm going to be letting Sean Lee, Kenny Stills, Wilson, Myers. We're letting all these guys go. And the reason for that is, is I feel like I can do a little bit better with Kenny Stills and Albert Wilson. We've got Drew Keenan Timmons. We've got Paris McMillan. We've got some young guys, some wide receivers that are going to do some good things for us. And there's even going to be wide receivers in the free agent pool next season, as well as this draft class has a lot of receivers that we could go that we could go after. But there's going to be some kickers too, some Big 12 team builder kickers that are pretty good. And I feel like we can do a little bit better on our offensive line as far as backups go. Marquise Flowers at 28 years old, 75 overall. I think we can do better. And uh, backup quarterback, that's going to be addressed uh, behind Jed Carmichael. Sean Lee, I'd love to bring him back for one more season, but it's kind of an expensive season at 9.88. All right, so taking a look at the standings here, guys, you'll notice that we are... Not even on the top of the board here. We are actually the 11th rated team at eight and six. There's a lot of teams at eight and six. So there's a ton of parity right now in this NFL, this 2020 NFL. Let's take a look at the AFC East standings. We're eight and six right now. The Patriots are catching us. We've lost two games in a row, but fortunately they have also lost one game in their last matchup for whoever they played against. I'm not sure, but the Bills are also chasing us. So theoretically, if we lose our next two games and the Bills win their next two games, I don't know what the tiebreaker is between us and the Bills. I'd have to go back and check that. I think we beat them both times. It could be wrong about that. But regardless, the Patriots have a chance. They have a chance to go 8-8 eight and eight if we lose two games in a row and they go 1-1. One and one. Or they could go 9-7 and seven if we lose two games in a row and then claim that AFC East title. So we are going to try to not allow them to do that. A couple notable quarterbacks that you guys need to think about, maybe just remember, is Montana Flynn. Montana Flynn, former Odessa State quarterback that elected to stay for his senior season. He's now a one-year pro. This is his second season in the NFL. He's leading the Buccaneers to a 336 points for team. And that's a lot of offense for a Buccaneers team that really needed it. They're currently 8-6, and six, not a super talented roster, but he's getting the job done for them. NFC East, we have the 8-6 and six Giants with Robert Bishop. And we'll go over statistics a little bit later, but they are a machine on offense with Robert Bishop at the helm. 378 points for, I think that that's the best in the NFL. And then when we go to, I believe the AFC West, the Denver Broncos. So C.J. Wicks, former Midland State quarterback, has got the Broncos to an 8-6 and six season record. And everybody seems to be playing well, except for the Raiders here in the AFC West. Judd Carmichael, 20 touchdowns, 9 picks, 62% completion percentage, 3,600 yards. He's having himself a pretty darn good season. Very, very efficient. And if we just look and see... What he has done throughout his career, he's gotten better every year. He's gotten better. This 2019, he was hurt, did not play every game. 200 attempts versus, actually it's completions, 324 attempts, 452. He's already surpassed the attempts from his rookie season where he threw for 20 and 7. So he's definitely getting better. He's improving every year. Yards per throw, per attempt, getting better as well. So Jed Carmichael kind of fitting into this NFL like we thought he would. Rushing stats, Andre Wingo, 666 yards. He is still hurt, and he's going to be out for six weeks. So he's not even going to be ready for a Super Bowl run if we get to the Super Bowl. I highly doubt it. But, you know, that torn bicep is really, really hurting us here. We're, you know, we're losing some games that we probably shouldn't be, and I think that that running game is really – being affected. Corey Clement is a good runner. Logan Sweeney's more that pass catching back out of Odessa State. But uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of we're kind of hurting here with the running back situation. 
Receiving numbers, Odell Beckham leading the way with 74 grabs, 71 catches for Kenny Stills. And you're probably asking yourself, like, why, Gold, would you not bring Kenny Stills back? He's your best number two guy. Well, it's because of the touchdowns, really, and the fact that he's a seven-year pro. He's getting up there in age. And, you know, a four-year contract that he was asking for would put him up to about 32, 33 years old. And we'd be stuck right in the middle of that kind of decline. And our young receiving core, they can do some good things. You know, Albert Wilson, we might want to consider bringing back. But Sweeney can catch it. McMillan can catch it. Timmons can catch it. So we've got some guys, some Big 12 guys, that are going to be good for us down the road. Odell Beckham's not going anywhere, in my opinion. 10 touchdowns, 1,100 yards. He's having himself a heck of a season. When we look at blocking, you always got to look at the downs played. So that way you kind of get an idea of how good that offensive lineman has been. The most sacks that have been allowed has been by Colton Miller of the Oakland Raiders allowing 16. I think it's 16 or 17, but it's it's in the double digits. And Jawan James has not been good either. He's got doubles. He's got 14. Delmar Nutt out of Ardmore is giving up 12. Only one year pro at our left tackle spot. Toby Dennehy has been great at center with five. Rondell Cooley with nine. So our offensive line, this CSU Pueblo is Denver Tech, by the way. Texas Permian Basin is Midland State. So our offensive line has been reworked. And, you know, it's a it's a work in progress. We got a lot of young guys on that O-line. We got a rookie here with Cooley. Dennehy's with one year experience. Ben Shaw's one year experience. Delmar Nutt, one year. So these guys are working through it. They'll be all right. It's kind of cool to, to know that this Miami Dolphins is ready for a dynasty type of run. All right, so fun part, defense. How are our guys doing on defense? Tackle-wise, Minkah Fitzpatrick nearing the 100 tackle mark at safety. He's got an interception. Bobby McCain's got four. One deflection. Does he have any touchdowns? Does he have any touchdowns? He has one touchdown. So I don't know if that was a fumble recovery. Nope, that was an interception. So he did have a pick six. Nice job by Bobby McCain. Uh, let's see, just right down here real quick. Raekwon Davis, our first round draft pick from just a year ago. Starting to come into his own, guys. Seven sacks on the season. And that was a huge leap from last year, if I'm right. Yeah, so he had one sack last season. And in 2020, taking a big step forward with seven. I think Raekwon Davis is going to be a good player for us, at least how he's rated in this game. So I know that he's kind of really not coming through for Alabama right now in real life. And um, a lot of draft prospects and draft analysis think that he's actually going to fall a little bit in the draft. Six foot six, like he's, a, he's an animal, he's a freak, he's got a lot of potential. But uh, at least for us, he's doing really well. Todd Parker... Our first round draft pick of this season has got five sacks. So he is nearing the same production as Raekwon Davis in his second year. Todd Parker's first year out of ACU. I love Todd Parker. He's great. He's awesome. I mean, look at these numbers. These are good stuff. Has he forced any turnovers? He is not. He's not forced any turnovers. That's all right. Just keep getting in the backfield and making some big hits. And we'll be all right. Now we're just going to go for just the most notable team builder players that are actually doing something. As far as like bench guys, we're not going to cover those players because they're not producing. They're not really doing anything. They're not on the map yet. We're only going to focus on guys like Robert Bishop, who's leading the way in NFL in yards and touchdowns. 35 scores for Robert Bishop. I mean, he was worth every penny for that pick for the Giants. They solved their quarterback woes after Eli Manning, thanks to Robert Bishop. 4,200 yards. He's a two-year pro. Like, he's taken the league by storm. There's Jake Fromm as a New England Patriot. And we just go down, 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 and we see Montana Flynn in his second year. 28 touchdowns, 13 picks, 64%. He is one of the best team builder quarterbacks that we've seen come through. Jed Carmichael kind of mirroring that Stafford type of production. That's really... How I classified Jed Carmichael is pretty hilarious when we look back at the old team builder videos from year one and year two. CJ Wicks, 15 touchdowns, 12 picks, so he has not been as productive. He's been kind of that game manager type of quarterback, but he is throwing for some yards, 3,500 in the Keenum, Darnold, and Bortles mold in that tier. 
58% though. 58%. Like that is just not going to cut it. That's not going to work. Definitely, definitely not going to work. Other quarterbacks down here, I don't think anybody else is worth mentioning. There's DD Dukes at 46%, 28 of 60. That's bad. And we know what DD Dukes is. He's not a pocket passer. As far as rushing attempts and rushing goes, it's not really going to be anybody team builder related. Most of these guys are one trick ponies. Other than, of course, Andre Wingo. He's the, been the workhorse back of this Big 12 team builder series. And, you know, he's been putting up numbers in the pros. 666 yards. He's in the upper echelon of yards. In the upper 25%, maybe 15%. And, uh, you know, him being hurt only with 138 attempts. These other guys have well over 80 more attempts than he does. Maybe even 100 more attempts than he does. I mean, Wingo would be leading the NFL in rushing yards for sure. Receivers kind of the same deal, guys. We don't really have receivers in this NFL series, at least right now, because it's so early, it's so young. They're basically, you got to treat them like they're freshmen. They're basically team builder freshmen. They're not really doing anything right now. But Carson Jackson, we always knew that he was going to be something special coming out of McAllen, and he's proving us correct in that prediction. I mean, his numbers speak for themselves. 68 receptions, almost hitting that 1,000-yard receiving mark for his rookie season. That's really special. Six touchdowns. I mean, he's going to be good for a long time. And he's really the only receiver outside of Amari Manuel that's really doing anything in this NFL series. Something I'm actually really impressed with is the team builder offensive lineman. Nolan Chung, former Ardmore player, 1,000 downs and only six sacks. And if you guys remember me talking about this, 17 sacks is the league high. Cordy Glenn was terrible in my Bengals franchise in Mad 19, and he continues to be terrible here in this game. And Braxton Terry Sims on 983 downs played, 14 games played. He has been a monster. 6'5, 290 out of McAllen. He's been great. He has been great. One sack. Like, I can't even stress that enough, guys. That's so good. And then when we just scroll down a little bit, trying to find some more guys, we've got, let's see, we've got Jacob Ziola out of Midland State. Only three sacks given up. Austin Grodhouse was the number one pick of last year, of the year ago. So they drafted Montana Flynn, and then they drafted Austin Grodhouse. It was a good draft for the Buccaneers. It's gameplay time. We got CJ Wicks. 8-6 Denver Broncos coming to Hard Rock Cafe Stadium to take on the 8-6 AFC, not rivals, but AFC opponents, Miami Dolphins. We're also 8-6. We're still fighting for our playoff lives, as are the Denver Broncos. This is a huge game for both teams. Stephon Anthony on the first play of the game going to sack C.J. Wicks. He has not been good for this Denver Broncos team, despite their record. He's been throwing a lot of interceptions, and Bobby McCain is going to pick this one off on the second play of the night, of the football game. This is a Thursday primetime game. So defense always seems to reign supreme on Thursday nights, and tonight is no exception. It's no exception. So here's Jed Carmichael, first time we've seen him in today's game. Logan Sweeney has been getting more workload due to Andre Wingo's injury. Same thing with Corey Clement. So we'll see a lot of these guys here maybe in this game but for right now the passing game seems to be working this 21 yards for Carmichael and Odell Beckham Jr. Here's a pass going to go completed to AJ Derby how he caught that I have no idea so he tipped it and then jumped for it afterward to make the athletic grab Logan Sweeney gets grabbed at the one yard line but nice awareness here to find Logan Sweeney on the swing pass and nobody was covering that right side of the goal line. Everybody was coming thinking this was going to be a run. So it's going to be a touchdown for Miami. It's 20 to nothing right here. And now Odell Beckham is just making people miss all over the place. He's got the speed to burn. And he is going to beat his man down the sidelines for the touchdown. It's now 20 
seven to three. And that look says it all. I mean, just watch the play one more time. We got Beckham with the spin move. He's making people run into each other. I mean, it's just, it's comedy hour here at Hard Rock Cafe Stadium. I mean, look at this. Look at these moves here by Odell. So this is why we brought him in here to be a big-time target for Jed Carmichael. And here's Paris McMillan making a nice grab up the middle. Nearing the end of the first half, Jeff Henderson, former Ardmore coach, is going to call timeout right there. So 11 seconds to go as soon as this throw is made, but we were looking for that sideline. Kenny Stills just could not get out of bounds. We are out of timeouts. We got to run to the line to try to get this thing spiked. Can't do it. So we're going to go into the second half, 27 to 3. And Drakean Timmons is going to take this football out, and he somehow gets all the way to the 30-yard line. So Drakean, I mean, you are just balling out right now. You're really, you're really taking your skill set to a different level here. But watch Odell Beckham again. He's having himself a night. That's two touchdowns already over 100 yards, and now Jed Carmichael is over 24 passing touchdowns on the season. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Jed's having himself a nice year number three. So 326 yards for Miami on offense. We're just absolutely schooling Denver and C.J. Wicks. That's the second pick of the night. And Rayshad Jones comes up with that one. 20th career interception, and now we're just going to try to put this thing on ice. Here's Paris McMillan, the McAllen product, and the two teammates, the two former Matadors, are going to hook up here on that first down. We're still slinging it. This game's not even close to over yet. Paris McMillan with the catch on the out route, and he dives into the end zone as he plants that foot, gets into the end zone. 4,000 passing yards for Carmichael. That's a career high. And, guys, we are going to win this football game and we're going to the playoffs. Or wait, we might not. A big win for the Dolphins. We scored 44 points on those Denver Broncos and we moved to nine and six, but the Patriots catch us at eight and seven, which means one thing. If we lose to the Bills in week 17 and the Patriots win this week, we have a tie at nine and seven and nine and seven. I don't believe both of these teams in the AFC are going to make it. I don't think 9-7 and seven is going to be good enough to make it come out of the two wildcard spots for the AFC East. And it doesn't look like that's going to happen because all of these teams, guys, are down here at 8-7. and seven. So this is a big week for us. It's a huge week for us in order to get this win against the Buffalo Bills. We're not playing this one. We're going to leave it to the sim. Cross your fingers. Did it happen? Did we make the playoffs? We lost. We ended up losing 31 to 10 and the Patriots won their last game of the season to continue the streak. The AFC East remains the New England Patriots division. Did any of our team builder quarterbacks push their team to a playoff appearance? It doesn't look like the, oh, the Broncos. The Broncos. They were 8-6 and six coming into that game that we played them. Moved to 8-7 and seven on the loss. Week 17, they got the W. Finished in second place in the AFC West, and they got in. They got in over us. How does that work? How does that work, guys? Because we both went 9-7. We should have gotten in over them. With the Super Bowl upon us, let's take a look at the MVP race. And Robert Bishop finished in the top five, but Deshaun Watson ended up winning the whole dang thing. Coach of the year goes to Thomas Pita. That's interesting. Interesting. Thomas Pita. Jeff Henderson finishes in the top ten at number nine. AFC Offensive Player of the Year. Carmichael finished in seventh place. Not good enough to beat out Deshaun Watson. Defensive player of the year, though, for the AFC is Bobby McCain. It must have been through all of the interceptions that he had. It's not really, it's not really normal that you would see a defensive back, especially a corner, 
win Defensive Player of the Year. So that's awesome to see that Bobby McCain was able to, to get that award for, for his trophy collection. Jake Fromm leading the Patriots to a 9-7 record. Logan Sweeney finishing in third. Kyle Rivera, former Midland State player, is going to push. No, Kyle Rivera was a was an Odessa State Dust Devil. So he was he was in the race for Offensive Rookie of the Year. Nick Reed finishes in fourth. D.D. Dukes in seventh. Dallas Humber in ninth. And it's just good to see that a lot of the Rookie of the Years were Big 12 related. Defensive Rookie of the Year goes to Evan Weaver. Kenny Brocious, a defensive mastermind for Denver Tech, finishes in second. Cade Chapansky for Denver Tech as well. And a lot of, just a lot of Denver Tech guys. Donovan Seidenstricker for Midland State up there as well. Number eight, Todd Parker, number seven. I love it. I love it. Big 12 is well represented. NFC Offensive Player of the Year, Robert Bishop finishes in fourth, but not good enough to catch Alvin Kamara. Defensive Player of the Year, we don't have anybody here except Cedric Granger finishing in 10th place. Offensive Rookie of the Year goes to Carson Jackson. I love it. I love that. We'll have to get a stats update on him, but he's a 90 overall player as a rookie. Now, at the end of his rookie season, he's a 90, so he must have did something incredible this year, we've got Herschel Gates finishing in third, DeQuandre Shook finishing in fifth, and Claudio Keller, and that's it. That's it for the offensive players from the Big 12. Defensive Rookie of the Year goes to Cedric Granger. No surprise there. The guy was amazing out at ACU, and it's really awesome to see that he was going to be rated Defensive Player of the Year. Roosevelt McKinney, former Ardmore cornerback. And then we got Bruce Hobbs, defensive back for Midland State, Sergio Armendariz, ACU, and then Chase Young out of Ohio State. So we're in the Pro Bowl now. And did any of our guys make it? I don't see. I mean, Odell Beckham, yeah, but he's an actual pro. I want to see if any of our team builder guys made the Pro Bowl. And it doesn't look like anybody did I am going fairly quickly whoa Jawan James gave up like a ton of sacks and he's in this what the heck Thurston Alexandro former Ardmore tackle so he made it that's nice so that's one that's one and I think that is it guys that's it so nobody else made it other than Thurston Alexandro and excuse me Taiwan Talbot, Little Rock cornerback, made it. So we had two. We had two. Nope. Kick returner, Mercutio Hardaway, and Jamil Schmidt, punt returner. So a lot of Ardmore, Denver Tech, and Little Rock. Nothing else really out there. But that's a pretty darn good uh, roster for the AFC, if I do say so myself. This is hilarious. Phillip Rivers, former quarterback for the Chargers takes the job over Patrick Mahomes. So that's hilarious. They don't believe in Patrick Mahomes in Madden 19 when this game first came out. That's so funny. He proved so many people wrong. That's just comical to me. So Phillip Rivers is your starting Super Bowl quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. They don't really have a lot going on with running back other than Rodney Anderson, Kareem Hunt. RIP, Kareem Hunt. Wide receivers, Tyreek Hill. Sammy Watkins, Kyle Rivera, and Jaywan Singleton. So they do have two team builder players already. Kyle Rivera and Jaywan Singleton. Tight ends. Nothing to write home about other than Travis Kelsey. Left guard, Chris Oyatunda from Ardmore. Center, nobody there. Right tackle, nobody there. Left end, nope. Right end, nope. Defensive tackle? Nope. Outside linebacker. Where's Santonio Farmer? There he is. That's what I like to see out of Fort Hayes State, a.k.a. Kansas A&M University. So Santonio Farmer going to be playing in his first Super Bowl. Whether he gets on the field or not, that's remained to be seen. But Taiwan Talbot, guys, one-year pro from Little Rock. He's an 84 overall. 
this guy, this guy is, this guy is something, something special. He's a star, dev trait. He looks pretty good in that KC uniform. So the Chiefs are well representing, <laughs> whoa, well representing the Big 12 team builder teams. Donovan Seidenstrecker is a captain. He's a captain on the Chiefs. And he's at the Gold Star level captain. So Andy Reid must really like himself some Donovan Seidenstricker for sure. So Case Keenum is going to be the starting quarterback in the Super Bowl for the New Orleans Saints. So pretty funny how that's all working out, right? For Minnesota, he kicks the Saints out. And now he's a Saints quarterback. Pretty, pretty hilarious to me. Nobody to talk about with uh, running backs, fullbacks, wide receivers. I feel like we had a defensive player for the Saints because I don't see any offensive players at this point. Defensive players, nobody yet. Mark Tarasovich, there we go. Mark Tarasovich out of Little Rock defensive tackle. Kiefer Nuttall from Ardmore. Pretty crazy, right? Ardmore's got a lot of players re well represented in this Super Bowl. Marcus McCullough, another Ardmore player here. Yeah, so they are well represented. Ladarius Best right there out of Amarillo. So yeah, Ardmore is um, well represented in this Super Bowl, and you know, you gotta think, Jeff Henderson just had a lot of talent, he was he was never able to just get it done and push the team over the top. I think it's pretty cool to see a lot of my Ardmore Thunderwolves playing in this Super Bowl. KC Chiefs against the New Orleans Saints. So there's your final score up there in the left part of the screen, 27 to 10, the Saints win the Super Bowl with Case Keenum at quarterback. Phillip Rivers still cannot get a ring. So guys, we are now in the offseason for re-sign period, and like I mentioned before, I'm not going to go ahead and sign or re-sign Kenny Stills, Albert Wilson. We're just not going to bring these players back, so there's really no point in this moment. And we're just going to go ahead and advance to free agency stage number one, where we're going to talk about what players we're going to go ahead and try to grab here for this Miami Dolphins football team. After this is done, we're going to go right to the draft, and do it real quick, real nice, put a bow on it, and get that all sorted out. And then from that point, I have major news breaking from Tom Roden on Twitter, the Big 12 Team Builder Reporter. Make sure you guys go check him out. Let's go 18.1, see where that gets us, 105. So he is really just not digging the offer here from the Miami Dolphins. Maybe he wants to be a part of a competitor. 20 million should do it. 113. That's still not going to get us Jason Kelsey. And because nobody's really going after him. So let's offer him that 12.2, just up it by 600,000 or 60,000, I should say. He's up to 92 points. So I feel like that that's good. Uh, cornerback, we could easily address this. I don't want to break the bank for cornerback, like for a guy like Desmond King. I, I feel like we could get Vernon Hargraves type, you know. Bobby McCain is an 81. We could get another 81 corner with Vernon Hargraves and see how he does with that. Let's get him up to about 13 and see what we got here. So 93. He's really liking the Washington Redskins right now. So I don't think that we're going to be able to get Vernon Hargraves unless, again, we try to break the bank. So what is – let's see this offer right here. Let's see what we can do. 16.3 million. And that only gets us to 107. So fair offers 12.5. We offered him 16.3. And meanwhile, Jimmy Smith, we could get on a one-year deal at 33 years old. So I feel like that's maybe the best, the best option that we can that we can do here. So let's just offer him this. See what we got. 93 points on Jimmy Smith. 24 million dollars. He's still not doing it. Most people are probably cringing in the comment section, like, what are you doing, Gold? What are you doing? 130. Get over here, Jason Kelsey. We need your ass on this team. 
Awesome. So we got all three of our guys here. We got Jimmy Smith, Kelsey, and Anzalone. That's awesome. So there is your roster as it currently stands. The offense got a heck of a lot better now, up to a 79 overall defense at that 79. So we got Jimmy Smith as our corner number one with Bobby McCain slipping over here to corner number two. That's probably got a switch, unless he is an 82. Yeah, he's an 82 overall. Then we've got Xavier Howard, Lavert Hill, Tankersley that we just signed as well. So defense is looking pretty good with uh, Anzalone taking the spot of Jerome Baker, McMillan, and Anthony. We I feel like we still need to go after a left outside or another, just another outside linebacker, which I think we'll do that in the draft. But I think we set ourselves up pretty nicely for this draft. All right, guys, here we go. We are in the draft, the 2021 draft. Remember, these are year four team builder prospects. So team builder players that you remember in year four that are coming over into the draft. That's what this is. That's who the players are. And let's go take a look at the draft board. This is the first time that you guys have been able to see it. And because we're already in 2021, there's no way for me to know exactly who is going to be available at that point, who was in the Big 12 team builder year number four that's going to be in this draft class. Like, there's just way too many variables, right? So you will see some fake players like Rashad Hoyerman, Stanley Felix, Nash Harrell. These guys are all fake. But I'm going to be covering to you guys, by position, team builder players. And we will take a look at their combine grades as well. So let's take a look at the first team builder player group as in quarterbacks. And we see the best quarterback in the Big 12 team builder is apparently Cameron Willis. Out of Texas Permian Basin, he had a 6.6 .6 in his combine, and he was a good one. Fifth. In the 40 yard dash at 4.6, vertical jump number two, bench press number two as well. So I remember Cameron Willis having those big arms, those big gun arms. A minus throw power, can scramble a little bit, throw under pressure. That's a good statistics for Cameron Willis. He's obviously a really good player, a player that we maybe think about taking if we were in a position where our franchise stunk. But our franchise doesn't stink. And it's going to be really interesting to see who takes a chance on Cameron Willis. He's listed as a first-round talent. But I know that with Dallas up here on the board, I don't know if they're going to go take a chance on Cameron Willis. Do you guys want to see something funny? This is Derek Whiteside. If you want to see Dexter Whiteside, he's down a little further ways. There's Dexter. Oh, my God, this is so funny. This is a quarterback generated by the CPU and I just thought it was funny because it's it's literally D Whiteside from Texas six foot three about the same type of quarterback as you know who Dexter Whiteside which we will actually go cover in just a moment but first we got to look at John Hicks looking at the third round he's 6 3 206 they list him as a scrambler I think of him more as like a Shea Patterson type but he can run a little bit right he he doesn't make a, lo a lot of very smart decisions with the football while he's at Ardmore. He could be classified as a, th as a thrower who is kind of a field general, a game manager type of quarterback, um, but he's got to limit the, limit the mistakes. I would see him more in a West Coast type of offense. He's not going to be a Tom Brady. He's not going to be a Peyton Manning. He's just, that's not him, right? That's just not him. He's more that Ryan Tannehill type of quarterback. And I'm not sure where he's going to go. I'm not sure where he's going to fit. A team that takes him is going to have to really work with him on his accuracy issues. He has got a lot of arm strength, but not super accurate. Gets into trouble a little bit trying to throw off balance. He's still a good quarterback. Can improvise a little bit on his feet. But I think that's fair for as a mid-third rounder. Rhett Bollinger. There he is. Late fifth. And that's... I think that that's pretty fair. They also list him as a scrambler, even though he's gonna he's he can move a little bit, but he's more he's more of that he's more of that field general type. That's again, that's not gonna be a quarterback that pushes anybody over the top. And Dexter Whiteside, good old Dexter. They also list him as a scrambler, and that's probably because of his decision making with the football in his hands, kind of like John Hicks. He can run a little bit at four seven, but 
you know, he's got a big arm. He's got a big arm, but he's more that gunslinger type of guy. And in the early sixth round, that's really where I would have pegged him to. Napoleon McQueen, we are done with quarterbacks. Let's talk about the running backs in this draft class here. 4-3 for Napoleon McQueen. 5-11, kind of that Javid Best type of running back, just going to speed on by people. That's really all he can do, because other than that, he's kind of a middle-tier athlete as far as the vertical jump goes, broad jump, three-cone, bench press. He's not strong in comparison to all the other running backs. He's going to be a good one. It'll be interesting to see where he lands. Seventh round talent. So he's not the flashiest guy in the world. Jesse Tyson is more that power back. He's six foot two, 240, basically like a fullback in there, kind of like even a linebacker. So he's going to bowl people over, and it just really depends on what you're looking for on your offense. If he falls, if a guy like this falls to you and you want a Andre Wingo 2.0, or a 1B, a 2B type of guy, is Jesse Tyson. 6'2", 240, power back. You take a chance on a guy like that. Diego Dobbs, a 4'6", running back in the broad jump. In the bench press, he was a beast. And, you know, we just looked at Jesse Tyson, but if you really want a guy like that's going to give you power yards, it's Diego Dobbs, and he's a good athlete as well. So if you're looking for that, you take Diego Dobbs. You guys remember Leonard David out of ACU? He ran a 4-6. Uh, he's a mediocre running back. And you know what? Six foot six, you would think that that's the case. 231 pounds, so he's a big guy. I think that that's fair for mid-fourth round. Demarcus Gibson is quick at 4-4. He's only going to catch the football from Odessa State. Not going to be a guy that runs in between the tackles at 5-10. He's got enough weight on him in order to do that, but... Again, he's more that receiving back. That's what he was used at as in Odessa. So that's really what his role is going to be in the NFL. Aaron Penner ran a 4-4. This is a guy that might be a diamond in the rough. You know, He can easily start making some plays in space at 4-4, three cone. He's very agile, very quick. 4.02 in the 20-yard shuttle. You are looking for an athlete that's got some good size to him. He's a little scrawny at 184. Could use to lift some weights or get some weight put on him. But Aaron Penner was pretty productive at ACU. So we might take a chance on Mr. Aaron Penner if he's available. If you want a Demarcus Gibson 2.0, it's Louis Preston. Even though he's listed as a power back, he's got 4.3 speed. He's very quick, very quick. But at 5'8", He's more kind of like Java Best. Uh, here we go. Some of our favorite players in all of the Big 12. Jake Wood, Lucky Benson, and Sidney Layton. Jake Wood. What can you say about Jake Wood? First and fullback for 4'6". He's one of the quickest guys. He's listed as a fullback. You could easily plop him in as a running back. But teams really like his blocking ability and the fact that you can use him in multiple, multiple situations. So Jake Wood is... Definitely a late fifth round type of selection, but don't be surprised. He's kind of like Peyton Hillis a little bit. And the pride of the Big 12 team builder, we've got a ton of wide receivers to look over. I'm actually not going to go over every single player from this point on. I just want you guys to see kind of where they're stacking up in comparison to all these other guys. Really, I mean, it's just going to take way too long. I mean, we're probably already 30 something odd minutes into this video. And I don't want it to take too long. But Dallas Wynn, 4-5. He's a possession type of guy. So he didn't overwhelm anybody at the, at the combine. He just did what he had to do. He's kind of like that DK Metcalf type. And I think that that's really where he's going to fall. I mean, I mean, you guys can see here. When we go to the all positions. Dallas Wynn is only in... Where is he at? He is all the way down at number 24. So if we're looking for another wide receiver that's kind of that Kenny Galladay type of guy that's a, a big guy that's going to be able to make some plays down the field, we could go after Dallas Wynn right there. Ulysses Neely was the better wide receiver. I would argue that. I would argue that at Midland State, even though he's not getting a lot of love at third-round talent. Uh, his catching leaves some things to be desired, but he's very, very quick, very, very fast. Jackson Lunhall, good, good player, 
He's a red zone threat at 5'11". I feel like he's kind of like a Danny Amendola type. He's going to run his routes to perfection. And I would just watch out for that for sure. Jabari McCollum, good player, but he's a project. He's more of a project type of receiver. Elliot Hushka, this was out of Odessa State, by the way. Elliot Hushka, a Denver Tech product in the fifth round. Lonnie Luke is seeming to go undrafted. So maybe, maybe we can find a home for him at some point. But a lot of these guys are going undrafted here. Andre Irvin, Rex Austin, Demetrius Marks out of Shreveport. Yeah, I mean, these are some pretty decent wide receivers that, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem to fit in the NFL. Got Jimmy Ireland, Jared Woodstrom, Bryce Maddox, Nolan Keck, some good tight ends that were fairly productive in the Big 12. I think Jimmy Ireland and Woodstrom were probably a little more productive than Maddox or Keck. I, I might be slighting Maddox just a little bit on that, but it'll be interesting to see where those guys go. Taking a look at left tackle, Ipke Zapanaral. Very good player. He's in kind of a good situation because there's not a whole lot of left tackles here, and he's a pretty good one too. So they like him as a first-round talent, but he's in the second round. You jump all the way down to Jeremy Schroeder from Ardmore, and, you know, compared to Matthew Morris and Jeff McCarty, I think Ipke Zappanarell is going to find himself in the first round. One of my favorite players at right guard, Kawika Lolotai from Midland State. He's going to be something special, guys. I will show you this first in bench press. Three cone. He's very agile. He's listed as a power type of guard. You know, if he's available, I'm taking him. I'm taking him. It's going to help that run game for Miami. And we're going to really be able to feed Andre Wingo the football. If we've got Lolotai guarding for him, you watch out. You watch out. EJ Backstrom would not be too bad either, but you see the dip. 6.7 to 5.5. 7.1. So Lola Ty gave it everything he had to go up against Tristinger, but that's a losing battle every time. So Tristinger won numerous, numerous honors and accolades at ACU while he was in this Big 12 dynasty. Can move, man. At tackle, for being as big as he is and the fact that he can move to the outside he might be a player that we want to watch out for as well to help that run game and to even help that passing game. I want to see where he falls. And you know what? He falls to 14. So we might be in the market to go after at least one of those offensive linemen. Willie Grant is probably not going to fall to our laps whatsoever. Joey Shanka might, but I think Willie Grant is going to be gone near the top of the list. He ran a 4-5. At 6 foot 4, 250, he ran a 4-5. This guy moves, and he was one of the best defensive ends in the Big 12 coming from Midland State. Joey Shanka, we all remember Joey Shanka, how he became something. He, he took ownership of his bad play at Nebraska State, and now he's really getting it going. I love Joey Shanka in this draft. I I admit it. I admit it. I'm I was so wrong. I was dead wrong about Joey Shanka. He was gonna be he was gonna be the meme of this entire series, and then he ended up breaking his dad's record of sacks in a career at Nebraska State, and he became a campus legend. I was wrong. I was wrong, Joey. Then Siobhan Washington, out of mid no McAllen out of McAllen University, and not a lot of people are showing him any love except for when he blew up the combine, running a 4-5. So everybody was talking about how this guy, Shavon Washington, didn't get a whole lot of playing time at McAllen. But then all of a sudden, he just like blew by people at the combine, and everybody's like, what? what? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? 6'3", 246. He was challenging Willie Grant for the fastest defensive end. That's saying something. So if we wanted to take a chance on a right end... Maybe Shavon Washington would be a guy that we'd want to do that with. Defensive tackle. We've got a few players here. Demetrius Rollins was one of the best defensive players on Kansas a and last season. He would be a good pick at 6.5. Combine grain. Thor Catale, 6'2", 325. So he's one of the biggest defensive tackle, if not the biggest, 
defensive tackle as far as weights goes. And I think that that's why everybody's kind of kind of ripping on him just a little bit is that he's kind of overweight. You know, he's he came into the combine overweight when everybody was trying to tell him that, hey, you, you need to lose some weight to get into football shape, and he just didn't do it. If you're thinking about a comparison here, it would be Albert Hainsworth, that type of player, and that's going to cost him some money. His laziness is going to cost him some money. But he was a McAllen product. But Amiri Hayes Branson was a part of that Broken Arrow team that won the Big 12 championship. And, you know, he brings a winning type of pedigree, a winning mentality. And at middle linebacker, might be something that we consider here in the later rounds. So running a 4-7, that's pretty quick. His pursuit is good. B minus in tackling. We need to be able to stop the run. We need to be able to build on that ability to stop the run because we're already plugging up that middle part of the offensive line, of the line of scrimmage with big man 6'7", Raekwon Davis, and big man Todd Parker. So if we were able to triple team that up with Amiri Hayes Branson, that would be pretty good 1-2-3 type of trio. Armand Hammer had a 8.2 combine grade. This was the greatest, the best combine grade in this draft class. And at 6'5", 246, you can't really argue with being able to take this guy. There's no, there's no reason why he should not be on anybody's board at all. You have to take him. If he's there, if he's sitting there, you got to take this guy. Once in a generational player out of ACU. I mean, look at those numbers, guys. We have seen athletic freaks come from the linebacker spot before that never panned out. But I think Armand Hammer is going to be a star. I think he's going to make it. All right, looking at cornerback now. We've had some corners that have been pretty good in this Big 12 team builder, but Tyreek Wyrick Dysert is another great player. Ran a 4-4, wasn't too strong. So the tackling might be an issue for Tyreek, but you know, you can use him in some wide receiving packages. He can kick off return, he can punt return. That's kind of what his his role is going to be, kind of that wild card, that jack type of guy that you can you can fit around and uh and use wherever you want to, but you know, he is going to be more of a zone type of guy instead of man to man because he's just not that strong. He's not that strong at 5'11. Uh, Jabari London is going to be taken in the second round, but he is a fourth round talent. He didn't do too bad, but you know, at 4'6, that's not very quick. That's not very quick at all. Um, he was one of the better corners in college at Little Rock, but it just doesn't seem like that's going to be enough to get it done. Kyle Myers from. Midland State, I believe. Midland State, pretty decent player. He's That's really all that it is. It's just decent. You got C's across the board. Elroy Palmer, the third, made a lot of plays. Made a lot of plays at McAllen. I'm surprised that he's actually in the third round. Monterius Brothers out of Uba. So Broken Arrow putting out another pro product. Then we have, of course, Uzuma Okafor. Ran a 7.2. In the combine as a grade, he had a 4.3. So man-to-man, -man, he's going to be able to keep up with anybody that you put across from him. But, you know, coming from Nebraska State, where the defense was never really that good, he's got a lot to learn about the NFL offense. We're getting close to finish before we start getting the draft underway, guys. James Washington, 7.9. Warren Jones out of Camu. James Washington was first in every single category for free safeties. Yeah, he's that good. He's that good. So if we're looking at a free safety, I mean, we can even switch him to strong safety to take over for Rayshad Jones if he's available. We might even think about doing that. But Warren Jones, more of a run support type of guy. Not too great as far as coverage skills goes. So that's really what Warren Jones is going to bring to the table. Connor Gatlin from... Broken Arrow, again, more of a run support type of guy. Says zone. He's just not that talented. All right, and so kickers are the only ones left. We've got Jed Satterwhite out of Broken Arrow, Coulter Degrosevich from Denver Tech, and then Jake Kitayama from Shreveport. And that's going to round it out, guys. So let's get this thing started and see where everybody's going to go. All right, here we go. So we're going to go ahead and skip each pick until we are up. So let's get this thing going. Dallas takes Willie Grant. Willie Grant is going to the Dallas Cowboys. He's the first overall pick. Wow. Wow. So he's that good. He's a once-in-a-generational type of talent. So congratulations to Willie Grant 
for being taken first overall in this 2021 draft. Next up, Kawika Lolotai going to Carolina. Man, that sucks because I really would have liked to have Lolotai to help our offense out. So next up, we get the fake player. The Bengals are going to go fake. Go figure. Eric Trichtinger goes to the Jets as an 83 overall player. Wow. So they have Justin Kendrick out of Broken Arrow at center. And now they got Trichtinger out of right tackle from ACU. So Washington is up. They take a fake. Demetrius Rollins going to John Gruden's Oakland Raiders. Tennessee Titans going to take a fake. Stanley Felix, a fake. Blake Fisk, a fake. The Browns, Malcolm McLeod. James Washington goes to Detroit. That's a really great pick. So I applaud Matt Patricia in taking James Washington. That's a really good player right there. They're going to love having a guy like that. And I couldn't be happier for Detroit getting a player with his caliber. Dallas Wynn going to the Bills. So we're going to have to try to cover Dallas Wynn this season. He's definitely going to play. There's no reason why he wouldn't as an 80 overall. The Chargers, the Bears, the Vikings, Ravens take Tyreek Wyrick Dysert. They like those speedy type of corners. They love taking defensive players, and he's going to be a good one at 78. Joey Shonka going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So he is now teaming up with Montana Flynn. He's teaming up with Dequandre Shook. Teaming up with a lot of Big 12 team builder players here. He is going to be good out in Tampa Bay. I can feel it. The New York Giants. And we are on the clock. So who are we going to take, guys? I think I know what this answer should be. And I think that we should be taking Armand Hammer. I think that this is the selection that we need to take. He's on the board right here. He's a once-in-a-generational defensive talent. You can't go anywhere else. You could take Ipke Zappanarell. There's no, re there's no reason to take Napoleon McQueen. We've got that running back situation all locked up. And there's just nothing else there, guys. I mean, Warren Jones, Jackson Lunhall. There's nothing else speaking to me right now. You have to take Armand Hammer. We can easily solve that linebacker spot right here and right now. You could, I guess, take Cameron Willis. <laughs> but that would be stupid. Don't take Cameron Willis because you got Jed Carmichael. And we believe in Jed Carmichael. There's no reason to do it. So we are going to take Armand Hammer. Once in a generational talent. He's an 82 overall superstar. Look at that. Look at that. He's ranked as the number four in true talent. We drafted him at number 20. The ratings speak for themselves. He's fast. The pursuit is there. The Block shedding is good. The strength at a 97. He's going to be laying the boomstick on our defense for years to come. So with the Armand Hammer selection, the Steelers are on the clock. They take a fakie. We're just going to keep skipping until we see a team builder player. Jimmy Ireland going to the Houston Texans. They kind of took a reach there, in my opinion. Unless they absolutely really needed a tight end. Ip K. Zappanaral going to the Denver Broncos. Thor Catale. Going in the first round. So the Cardinals felt like they could work with Thor. They love his potential, apparently. Patrick Law, the Eagles next up. Marquise Duvall from Amarillo. And then the Chiefs taking Glass. Malik Purnell going to the Saints. And then we're back to rounding this out. And from here, I think... Now's the time where I'm just going to go ahead and skip the entire draft. We made our first round selection, and there's some good players here left up on the board. But um, I think it's just smart because we really do need to get this video uh, done and over with here. All right, so we took Armand Hammer with our first pick, and then we got Jordan Sizemore out of Little Rock. You guys probably don't remember Jordan Sizemore, but he was a pretty decent player at right tackle. But we got some good guys here. We got BJ Walters and Thomas Dwyer. Never heard of them, but still kind of cool just to see. It's almost like open up your gifts on Christmas morning. You don't know who you're going to get, right? It's just kind of cool to see where everybody landed. Lonnie Luke goes to the Eagles. The Falcons get Jake Wood. No, Jake Wood. 
So that's kind of cool. Devin Giunta from Nebraska State going also to the Falcons. So I obviously wish my boy Jake Wood luck out there in Atlanta. Shavon Washington is a 75. So the 49ers took a huge shot at Shavon Washington. I think that they're going to be pretty happy with that 87 speed. The Giants took Amiri Hayes Branson in the second round, so they definitely went they went with a reach there to get Amiri. Cameron Willis is going to be backing up Robert Bishop. So that's pretty unfortunate for Cameron Willis. I would have liked to see him get a get a starting job, but you know, the Giants they got a good thing going as their number 1 quarterback and the number 2 quarterback there. Maybe they're anticipating they're not going to be able to pay Robert Bishop in the future. Maybe Cameron Willis is going to be the guy uh, for years to come. Andre Irvin out of Camu, wide receiver, also a New York Giant. Jaguars, they get Diego Dobbs. They like that power type of back. Nobody else. The Jets took Trichtinger, then they took Backstrom, then they took Elroy Palmer. They love team builder players. Then they got Aaron Penner here. 93 speed, 65, so they're going to work with him from the seventh round. So the Jets actually did some really good picks. They actually really had a good draft uh, compared to us. The Lions took James Washington, who's an 83. Jackson Lunhall, Tyler McKinney. Man, so Detroit. Detroit knows what's up. The Packers, what'd they get? They got Jameel Crawford, Elliot Hushka. That's a pretty decent draft class for them. The Panthers obviously got Lolo Tai. Lucky Benson at fullback. The Patriots like McAllen players, apparently. They got A.O. Garrison and Bryce Maddox, so just watch out for those two guys. In the AFC East, Demetrius Rollins, Garrett Abanez, Derek Whiteside, not Dexter. Wow, so Derek Whiteside fell to the third round. They got a third round quarterback as an 80 overall player. So Uzuma Okafor, that's pretty cool to see that he's going to be wearing the silver and black at a 96 speed rating. I like what Oakland did. The Rams got Jared Woodstrom, Jeremiah Price, Demetrius Marks. Ravens, we know that they got Tyreek Wyrick Dysert. Brody Sathoff, we didn't cover him, but very good offensive lineman for Midland State. Leonard David, nice power back there for them. Then, ooh, look it. So the Ravens got Dexter Whiteside. So Whiteside's going to be maybe a third string backup, maybe even the backup to Lamar Jackson. They also got Rory Stronghead. We didn't really cover Rory, but they see him at six foot seven, I think. Six eleven, I actually. Six eleven or six foot seven. Yeah, he's six eleven. He's six eleven. <laughs> yeah, they like to see what they're gonna do with him as a project type of type of guy. Warren Jones going to Washington, Jeremy Schroeder. There you go. So Washington loves their team builder players too. Cameron Azugwu, Jabari McCollum. Washington had a good draft. Saints. Nothing. The Saints hate our guys. They're taking a totally different stance. Remember in year one and year two, they loved them. Now they're going away from them. Seahawks, what did you guys do? What did you guys do? They didn't take anybody. They took nobody. The Steelers, nobody. Deshaun Watson. Titans took Jabari London at a 72. Luke O'Reilly, 71. So, you know, the Titans had a very low-impact type of draft. The Vikings, they took Ulysses Neely, Vandermeulen, Jeff McCarty. Very grindy type of draft class for the Vikings. We're almost there. The Bears... What did they do? They took Monterius Brothers. Nobody else. The Bengals. What'd they do? Nothing. The Bills got Dallas Wynn as an 80. So, again, we're going to have to watch out for him. Anton Birkin Duvall out of Ardmore. The Broncos took Zappa Norell, so they're going to try to protect C.J. Wicks. Maybe they felt like Wicks threw way too many interceptions last season for their liking. And then we've got Everett Frederick. We didn't cover Everett, but very grindy type of type of lineman as well. 
the Browns. They didn't take any of our guys. And then the Buccaneers. I want to see what the Buccaneers did. So they took Joey Shockey's a 78. And then that was it. That was it. So they only got one team builder player. Cardinals, Thor Catale, Connor Gatlin is 72. And that was it for them. Chargers. Sidney Layton, fullback, 76. They're going to like him in that run game with Austin Eckler and Melvin Gordon. Jesse Tyson for the Chiefs, so they liked what they saw out of him. Going to be pounding that rock a little bit. Rhett Bollinger, nice. Okay, so he might find himself some work behind Mahomes. Going to learn from the best in the game. And Phillip Rivers, apparently. Louis Preston at 96 speed, so he'll find a home with Kansas City, no doubt. And then the Colts took Vince Barrow, tight end from Midland State. And then the Cowboys, they got Willie Grant, Napoleon McQueen, holy crap, Nolan Keck. The Cowboys might have had the best draft, just, be, just based on these two players here. So Napoleon McQueen and Willie Grant. Wow. And then you have us getting Armand Hammer. And Jordan Sizemore. Time for a Galarza, Vicente Galarza update, guys. Currently, he is a New York Jet. Remember, this is year number four, heading into year five. So we're almost caught up as far as NFL action goes. So right now, you see him in that Jets uniform, except we know that he was arrested on charges of money laundering and fraud, as well as betting on games. They would later find out that he was betting on games, McAllen games, and determining those outcomes. So we always knew that Galarza was kind of a dirty player. He was trying to target players, trying to injure them, trying to basically have maybe he even put bounties on the guys' heads. That has not been proven. We don't know that yet. But what we do know is that he profited off of his game, in-game memorabilia, and his betting to fix McAllen games. Who allowed for that to happen? Well, he is claiming that Brock Musselman is the guy that allowed for that to happen. That Brock Musselman was involved in some capacity to allow for Galarza and maybe Musselman to profit off of betting and rigging games for McAllen. Now, we know that McAllen was a part of very many, many close football games. Namely, the triple overtime game against Ardmore. The game against Midland State where the, the Hail Marys, the three straight Hail Marys for both sides end up winning the game for Midland State's favor. Not to mention other games that were even had an out of conference game where their kicker missed an easy chip shot field goal, not calling timeouts when they should have. It's it all lines up to where Musselman is in charge of this whole operation that he's the guy that's at fault. Well, nobody can prove that. It's all falling on Galarza. And the fact that Musselman has now moved on to Amarillo. It's it kind of muddies the the water a little bit. Nobody knows really what's might what might be happening with the Musselman Galarza connection. The only thing that they do know right now is that there is someone working with Galarza or who had been working with Galarza during year three and year number four. The co-conspirator is apparently driving a red BMW with the license plate on the back. Capital letters BA5, the number 5, dollar sign TAR. What that means, we can only guess. We only can speculate at that point. It's very cryptic. The guys in Discord have been trying to figure it out. And I would urge you guys to also, in, your, in the comment section, you try to figure this out because it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But what we know is that Musselman sent off a report. He sent off the report, the complaint about Galarza, you know, being involved in some scheme while he was a matador. And basically going after Danny Booker, the old Odessa State quarterback, while Galarza was playing against them. Danny Booker was approached by Galarza saying, hey, take some money, man. Let's rig this game. I can give you some cut of the money, too, if as long as you rig this game. Well, apparently Galarza had made a ton of money even while he was in the pros doing things like this. 
It's yet to be known if he was paying recruits. It's yet to be known how much exact money that he made off of these bets. And sometimes he wasn't actually betting on rigging games, but who knows at this point what Galarza was even capable of. All we know is that Danny Booker's father reported Galarza, and that was the complaint that Brock Musselman sent off to the compliance department, which they found no connection with Musselman, so he's off scot-free. The person that they saw, that at least Danny Booker saw, with Galarza was driving that red BMW, and they can't seem to identify who this person was. The only thing they, they can identify is the license plate. Booker did not take any money. Odessa State is not at fault in this situation. Booker went on to try his best. He threw for four touchdowns. And his father reported Galarza, not Danny Booker. Danny Booker did not do anything to report Vicente Galarza. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Tom Roden busted this one out tonight. New updates on the Galarza arrest. We heard about the Danny Booker encounter and perhaps the co-conspirator with Galarza in a red BMW coupe. More developments have taken place as Big 12 official Bob Andrews, uh, initials are BA, I'm not sure if that's a connection, has come forward and claimed that there was an official on his crew under his suspicion did not allow Gunnar Rivers to come back onto the field against Odessa State in the infamous Hale Paris game where Odessa State transfer Cameron Willis, number five, threw the game-winning touchdown to beat Little Rock. The official in question did not allow Gunnar Rivers to get back onto the field, claiming that his helmet popped off when he got injured and he had to sit out a play for the team's two-point conversion attempt that would have allowed for them to come back in the game or to at least take a lead. That part I don't quite remember, but it was a crucial time in the game. Rivers was quoted saying, I was fine to come back in the game, but they didn't let me come back in. Who was the referee? It was Danny Booker's uncle, Ron Paulson. Head referee Bob Andrews' suspicion is that Paulson was involved in this elaborate money-making scheme as he was also spotted talking to that very same person in the red BMW coop how big does this go nobody knows quite yet but if you want to follow more with this big 12 news with the updates go follow tom roden at tom roden three link is in the description for his twitter account so guys that is it for today's madden update it's an over an hour long video i hope you enjoyed it Leave a like if you like this thing, and if you have any theories whatsoever as to who this person is driving that red coupe, who seems to be the guy that's in charge of this whole operation, this whole elaborate scheme, post in the comment sections below. I can't wait to see what you guys are thinking. Leave a like if you like this thing. We will see you on Saturday morning for conference play as it begins. See you guys then. As always, peace.